and we're going to be in John chapter 6. Okay, John chapter 6. We've been in a study of John uh, uh, through the summer, and I appreciate you guys enduring with that. Today, uh, we're going to look at a portion of chapter 6 and relate it back to the rest of the chapter just for the sake of time, okay? So if you wouldn't mind standing in honor of the reading of God's Word, I'm going to read John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40. John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just uh, pray that uh, your word penetrates hearts and minds, that uh, if there's anyone here who hasn't received the bread of life, we pray that today would be this day of salvation so that they would be raised up with us on the last day. And Lord, I pray that you just give us ears to hear the truth from your word this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so, I appreciate you guys very much. I, uh, uh, I started preparing this message many, many weeks ago. And uh, I'm delighted of the events that have come about. But as I was sort of refreshing my mind on this message this morning, one that I had prepared many, many weeks ago, I began to realize that God's timing is just exquisite, isn't it? Amen. And uh, as, as I was uh, 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 considering uh, the emphasis for this passage of Scripture, I, all of a sudden it just dawned on me this is Communion Sunday. And in fact, we are going to be celebrating together the bread of life after this message. And so, um, uh, so as we think about uh, the passage of Scripture I just read and the fact that Jesus is that bread of life, I hope that the events that I unpack from you out of John chapter 6 will help make some more sense. So um, I've done a series through John, and I'm not going to go through all of the fine details of that this Sunday just for the sake of time. However, we did, uh, we have been kind of numbering the miracles and since I may not be able to come back uh, to John for uh, several months or maybe a, a long period of time, I hope that you've learned something about the architecture of John, the Gospel of John that you'll be able to take with you. John focuses on seven miracles and the one we're gonna look at today is the fourth one. We've already emphasized uh, these three that are listed here, the water to wine, the healing of the official's son, and the pool of Bethesda. So uh, what we're going to look at today is uh, uh, we're going to start all the way back in verse 1 of John and then get to our focal passage of Scripture today. And I think that this passage of Scripture is extremely familiar to many of you, and it's included in all of the Gospels, but uh, we get to... Uh, uh, the first verse of chapter 6, and we see that uh, after Jesus gets done with his ministry in Jerusalem, he heads back towards home. And if you remember, Jesus came from Nazareth, which if you go to the Sea of Galilee, and you go to the northernmost point of it, and, and you go west about 10 miles, that's where Nazareth is. And so he goes back to the region that he's originally from, but uh, the crowds follow him, and his ministry has begun, and he's beginning to perform miracles. And so that's what's happening in the dialogue when we read in verse 1, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. This past week, I was... Uh, talking with some friends who were in my prayer group, and I, I said to them, I wish that I, had, I could have seen 
the Sea of Galilee with my own eyes, I think it would help quite a bit. And one of my friends who has been there said, well, let me tell you something. He says, maybe this will help you. He said, imagine a lake that maybe is about twice as big as Smithville Lake. It, but it's, so, it's small enough that you can see across to other points on the other side. He said, only the water most of the time is really choppy and rough in the middle because it lies in a low valley. And uh, the winds just very naturally swoop over the water, especially in the middle of the lake, not so much on the outer edges that are much calmer. And he says, that's sort of what the Sea of Galilee is like. And my friend has a daughter who's uh, sort of like an undercover missionary in the city of Bethlehem. And so she, I can't reveal her identity whatsoever, but he goes there to visit her from time to time and, his, and uh, her husband and, and grandson that are there. And, and he's told me, he said, that uh, it's really a beautiful lake it's a peaceful lake, and it's not anything at all uh, like we think about a sea being. And, and in fact, they do call it uh, Lake Tiberias uh, in the Holy Land. They don't actually call it the Sea of Galilee. And so I think that it's really cool that in this first verse that uh, John actually says, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, I didn't go into any extensive look, but I know Tiberias is a Roman name, so I'm sure that the Sea of Galilee was renamed for some sort of a Roman leader. But I wanted you to have sort of this picture because as the dialogue unfolds, it's important for you to realize what the people were seeing and what they were experiencing as this unfolds. As a lake that's not a, a huge uh, sea, but in fact is a lake that you can look and see points on the other side uh, of the shoreline. And so uh, Jesus had been performing miracles and the crowd was following him because they saw the miracles that he was doing. And he, what was he doing? Well, he was healing the sick. He was uh, helping the lame and the infirm so that they were healthy and whole again. And Jesus, when it says in verse 3 that Jesus went up on the mountain there and he sat down with his disciples, just remember that this lake is sort of like down in a bowl and that the outer edges are much higher. And so it says that when it, he went up on a mountain, we're not talking about the Rocky Mountains where Pastor Justin is, but we're actually talking about those high places, which we have some of them around here where they, it's, they're not really mountains as we think about the Rocky Mountains, but they're high places that are very natural places. Uh, so that you can see a great distance. So on the edge of, the, of Lake Tiberias, or on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus goes up to that highest point, and He looks and He can see the people who have been following Him. And why wouldn't they follow Him? Because He provided uh, health to those who needed that healthy touch. He provided encouragement and hope most importantly, He provides hope. And He provides hope and encouragement to you and I today. It says on verse 4 of chapter 6, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. And lifting up His eyes then and seeing a large crowd was coming toward Him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Okay, my, there we go. Where are we to buy bread so that these people can eat? Verse 6 says that he said this to test him, to test Philip. For he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. Okay, in today's terms, 200 denarii well, a denarii is about a day's wages. So I know that the day's wage in each of your mind probably fluctuates uh, uh, quite drastically, okay? But let's just suppose that uh, the minimum wage were $15 an hour everywhere. It's not, 
but there are a lot of places now that are striving for that. Well, so what would a day's wages be? About $120, okay, about $120. And so basically what we're seeing here is Jesus' uh, disciple is saying it would cost thousands of dollars to feed these people. It would cost thousands of dollars to feed these people. And there's another problem. This is kind of like a rural area. To this very day, this is a rural area. That the houses are far apart. And uh, the cities are still really, really small. And that, uh, and that they're distant. And, uh, and so that's another problem. But Philip is thinking about the tangible. He's thinking... You know, Lord, we don't have that much money in our treasury. There's, there's very little. He's thinking about the physical limitations. And there's something for us to be learned just from this. Is that oftentimes in our flesh, we think about our limitations instead of our opportunity. But look what's happening in the next few verses. One of his disciples in verse 8. In verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, now that's Peter's brother. Andrew said, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And so Andrew looked at what they had instead of what they didn't have. And that's an important conclusion I think that we all need to draw out. Is sometimes we need to look at the tools that the Lord has given us because when I prayed for our offering just a little while ago, what did I say? God, you have supplied all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And that's a verse of Scripture. And he has, hasn't he? But sometimes his definition of what my need is is different than my own. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Oftentimes it is. But he does supply all of our needs. And Andrew, without having read that verse, because the Apostle Paul was still lost... <laughs> and hadn't penned that verse yet, he's stepping out on faith and he's saying, well, look, let's look at what we have and see how that will work. And Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And so he performs the fourth miracle. Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Just a clarifying point, uh, when you're reading this, and I know how gender specific we are in Western thinking, especially in American culture, but these are actually the men of working age that they're counting. Okay, So everyone else that goes with those men would be numbered separately. So it says 5,000 here. And uh, as I don't want to take away or add to Scripture one bit, but this really is 5,000 working people. What about the boy who had the fish and, and the barley loaves? He wasn't counted among those 5,000 men. So what I'm saying is, is there were certainly thousands more that are numbered here. Boy, that's a lot of people. I'm thinking even 200 days wages <laughs> would be, it would be tough. We're not going to take them to the Longhorn Steakhouse, are we? <laughs> There's no way. We'll only be able to take about a half a dozen of them there, all right? But, uh, but what we are going to do is provide some sort of sustenance from, for them. And uh, this, is, this is a big task, and I don't, want to, I don't want to minimize the task at all. It's a huge task, even bigger than we can think about, because oftentimes some of you, some of you ladies especially, You've prepared for large meals, like Susan's, you know, she prepares for the big serve. And that's a big undertaking that uh, she administers for us every month. And we're all very, very appreciative of that. But she plans for 150 people, perhaps, maybe 120 people. She, but that, to me, that's more than I could, that's beyond my skill level. And I, and I look at this, and I think, this is 50 times that perhaps a hundred or a hundred and fifty times that particular effort. Verse 11, Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. Let me just uh, bring a little parallel here that doesn't have to be precisely a parallel, 
But the first part of verse 11, it sounds an awful lot like what happened with the disciples in the upper room. And we can read about that account later on in the Gospel of John. But when he took the loaves and after he had given thanks, he broke the bread. And we're going to do that together in remembrance of the Lord's broken body and of His blood that was shed for us on the cross. But already we're sort of seeing sort of the prequel of what's going to happen in the upper room and what we observe now as the church taking place as everyone is sitting down. So they gave them as much bread and fish as they wanted from this little basket that contained very little. Verse 12, And when they had eaten their fill, He told His disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that He had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Amazing. Twelve baskets of bread from five barley loaves that was intended to be a lunch for a young man. That's incredible. Uh, The thousands of people that were fed. And they didn't just eat a little. See, the original plan, if you look back at Philip's plan, the original plan is, you know, if we could at at least give each one of them a little, but it seems as though they all ate to contentment. Now, if I had been there, I probably would have had a couple extra fish and a couple extra loaves. Because that's, and I'm sure that there were people there that had that sort of personality, but everyone ate to contentment. This fourth miracle that Jesus uh, performed is just outstanding. And it met a hunger need because those, these folks had followed him a long ways and there, there wasn't a catrix for them to stop at and have a quick, a quick bite to eat. That wasn't available. They couldn't go through the drive through at Sonic. They were a long distance, and many of them had followed Jesus to the point that they hadn't planned, and so they weren't bringing so much food with them. This little boy was probably very unusual in that he had a lunch that he brought with him. But look at the conclusion they came to. It's a little disturbing to me, and I hope it is to you as well. In verse 14, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus is much more than a prophet. Verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Remember, I keep bringing this up about John. And I hope you'll remember it the rest of your life. I don't care if you remember that I told you. All I care is you remember is that John tells us over and over and over again that Jesus knows the hearts of all men. And He knows your heart. And that should disturb you a little bit, especially if you're wrestling with sin like I am. He knows that. But it should also be a comfort to you (laughs) in knowing that He'll take evasive measures when they're appropriate. Sometimes they're not because He wants you to grow. But He knows your heart. And it makes it so personal then when we pray that He knows our heart. But Jesus' time had not come yet. And He knew that their idea of a king was an earthly king that would overthrow the Roman government. And we talk about this in other contexts with our Lord. And He realizes His time hasn't come this is one of those early, early incidents where Jesus realizes this and He withdraws. He goes up and away from the people to get away from them so they won't take Him and make Him king. Their idea is that He is a prophet. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say they really saw Him as some sort of magical provider. Someone who could meet their needs and grant their wishes. But really what you and I need, we don't need that. What you and I need is a king that will provide eternal life by paying for the sacrifice of our sins. And Jesus knew that He needed to be that first and foremost because that was the Father's plan, not ours. 
This is interesting what happens. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea to got into a boat, and they started across the sea to Capernaum. So, <clears throat> so uh, they were right here in Tiberias, and they went over to Capernaum. And remember, the size of this was such that you could almost see the other side, especially if there wasn't much mist or fog that was preventing you from doing that. But the waters, the deeper waters that are right here are treacherous, I'm told. And the disciples are looking around and they're like, well, where's Jesus? Well, he must have headed on towards home because it's, it's not marked on this particular map, but Nazareth is right here in this region. And so they're thinking he's, he's headed towards home. He realized that he couldn't stay here, and so he headed towards home. So I messed it up, David. There we go. <laughs> and uh, so they got into the boats, and, or to, into a boat, and, uh, and headed across uh, the Sea of Galilee. It was dark now, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said, It's I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land to where they were going. So we know where they were going. They were going up here to Capernaum from Tiberias. They were going to Capernaum. Three or four miles, they were just getting into the deep water, and, G and the waters get rough. Jesus comes and meets them. But that's not the only miracle. The other miracle is, is suddenly they're at their port of call. All of a sudden, they're there together. Verse 22, On the next day the crowd remained on the other side of the sea, saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with His disciples. They were looking for Jesus. But His disciples had gone away alone. They had left in the night, right? Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor His disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Because they realized that this was yet another miraculous thing that had been done, that Jesus wasn't confined by geography a bit. And that's why they were asking the question, as they were asking, how did this happen? Verse 26, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has set His seal. Then they said to Him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Well, the people were short-sighted and Jesus knew their hearts, so he realized that their motives were all wrong. And he told them, he confronted them with it, and he said, there's some more important things for you to do. And we're up to the point where they're saying, what are those more important things that we must be doing? And he says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him, God the Father has set His seal. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I need a little bit more clarification because that seems like a really broad answer. And I think the original audience that heard Him say that was thinking something similar. Uh, they said in verse 28, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. That you believe in Him whom He has sent. Well, Jesus knows their hearts, 
but he has just given us a very important theological truth that we see in other portions of scripture too that you can't do anything to save yourself the work that we're given to do is to believe in him to trust in him and this is a beloved hymn i love this hymn trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus except to trust and obey and you know the ver- the very first verse of that song gives us a little more detail about what we should do to believe in him when we walk with the lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still with all who will trust and obey so do you get the content of the message in that verse that's biblically oriented and what jesus is trying to tell the crowds right here is that it's very very important for us to have a relationship with jesus jesus is the bread of life he is that bread now they get confused in the verses that follows and so we see this discussion which i'm not going to read through the next several verses i challenge you to look at it for yourselves but they grumble at him and say well we don't want manna <laughs> and they're think they're thinking about moses and they're thinking about the bread that god fed the Israelites with as they wandered in the wilderness and and they were they were thinking about sustenance and physical things they were focusing on the wrong things they were focusing on their physical needs when in fact we have physical needs you have physical needs we all have physical needs but we have a spiritual need that's much greater because if that spiritual need is not met with the sustenance that we need then our end result is going to be eternal damnation. And so it's crucial for us to have the sustenance we need. Jesus is just telling them that he does meet that need. He is the bread of life. And they get it all twisted up because they go, "Ooh, we don't want to eat your body. We don't want to drink your blood." But I think we know when we celebrate as believers together the very act of communion that it has nothing to do with drinking the actual blood or eating the actual flesh of Jesus Christ. Now I say that and I want you to understand that there are some people out there that profess to be Jesus followers that believe not us, but there are others that believe that that bread turns into the flesh and that the wine is the blood, that it turns into the blood. But that's not the point. See, they're just like these folks that are gathered around Jesus. They're missing the point. They're thinking of tangible things and they're not thinking about spiritual things. And so uh, we get uh, to verse 40 and Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life and I will raise Him up on the last day. Interesting, this, ver- this verse, if you uh, grew up as a Hebrew, if you grew up as a Jew, as an Israelite, then you probably knew the historical account of when the children were complaining about the manna from heaven and God sent poisonous snakes into their midst. And as a cure, Moses begged God for a cure, And as a cure, he made a bronze snake that was on a pole that was lifted up. And anyone who was bit by the snake, if they didn't want to die, they looked on that pole and believed that God would save them. And so there's sort of this this reference to that when it says to look up to the sun. See, Jesus has become that emblem, that symbol for life. And the Jews grumbled again. (laughs) Verse 41. They grumbled because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I have come down from heaven? See, Jesus doesn't live too far away from Capernaum. It's just like a morning walk. It's just a couple hours walk away from where they're at right now is where Jesus grew up 
where his father had a business. In fact, Jesus' father's business probably took him to Capernaum quite frequently because there was a big edifice that was built there for the Romans. And so these folks know who Jesus is. Well, some of them in the crowd, the ones following him from Jerusalem, are just getting to know him. But you know how it is when you go back to your own hometown, right? So we're in Lawson, Missouri. Of course we understand this, is that we all know each other's business, whether we wanted to or not. And they're doubting what Jesus is saying now, not because of the signs that he's done, but because of the relationship that they had with him before these signs. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, don't grumble among yourselves. Now I wonder if this is just another display of Jesus knowing the hearts of all men. I wonder if any of them thought, did I talk that loud that he could hear me? He seems to know my inner thoughts. I wonder if some of them thought that. It doesn't say here in Scripture. Verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. And I'll raise him up on the last day. You see, what we're getting to is that what's important is what happens at the end. What's important goes way beyond the time that's marked by watches and clocks, by the, the uh, earth's uh, rotation as it faces the sun. We're talking about eternity that goes way beyond time, measured time. That's what's important, is so that on the last days we can be raised up actually means in the days that, uh, that follow this particular life. Because there's only two outcomes. There's no third. The outcomes are this, life with God or life apart from God. Separation from God. It's an important thing for us to think about as we think about the bread of life. Jesus is the sustenance that will allow us to have life with him. And I pray that as you live your life, it's not just at communion time, you reflect on the fact that Jesus is that sustenance, that it was his broken body that paves that way. I hope that you'll live out your lives in such a way that you realize that you are your, his messenger and that you are um, to live out the gospel, that we're to live out the gospel in our lives so that others may know that Jesus is the one way that we have to that sustenance that provides us life with God forever. So we have these learning outcomes. We must believe in Him in spirit and in truth. Again, this is emphasized in the Gospel of John that... Uh, That what Jesus is talking about is about spiritual things, about things beyond this physical life. Remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, all he could think about was a physical birth at first. And Jesus says, no, you've got to be born of flesh, but you've also got to be born of spirit. He was trying to lead him on to the, the birth of spirit. And remember, Jesus knows all hearts. And that eternal life is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we must let him lead our lives. We must trust him and obey him and let him lead our lives. He is the bread of life. He is the bread of life. So Josh is going to come here in just a moment. And he's going to lead us through uh, communion this morning. But I want to close in my message in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would uh, save the lost. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't understand the importance of uh, this sustenance, this bread of life, that uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would draw them to you and that uh, they would receive you, Lord, as Savior. Please save the lost. And not only us in this sanctuary right now, but let us, even as we go from this place, proclaim the gospel in our lives in such a way that others are drawn to us in our community and that the lost would be saved right here in our community, Lord. 
Dear Lord, uh, just thank You for the truth of Your Word. Uh, let us not just let this lie there, but help us, Lord, to uh, be assertive and use it. Emboldened, emboldened empowered or empowered by, by the truth Jesus that Jesus hearts, knows our hearts and that we're going to spend eternity, that we're going to spend eternity with you, God. Uh, let that, uh, let just, that uh, be just be that incentive for us to, for us to, to, keep, to that keep that spirit burning bright in our lives Monday through Saturday, Monday through Saturday as well as on Sunday. In Jesus, name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.